Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. Some people often ask, why do the Quranic verses in some passages jump around from topic to topic? What is the relevance or connection? What is the methodology and style of the Quran? Some say because it is not orderly and coherent, it must be words of man, not God. In the past lectures, we have spoken about the fact the Quran explains itself, but requires one to study the entire Quran and be familiar with its con uh, content, message, and the goal. We have explained the connection of verses in a lecture called Quran and Connection of Verses. Please refer to that lecture for more detail. In this lecture, we want to discuss the methodology of the Quran on how it conveys its message to the reader and the reasoning behind it. To answer these questions, we must, need, uh, we, mu we must first understand, we need to understand the types of verses within the Quran. There are verses which are self-explanatory. For example, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتُبَ عَلَيْكُمُ السِّيَامِ كَمَا كُتُبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلَكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ O you who believe, fasting is prescribed to you as it was prescribed to those before you, so that you may learn self-restraint. Then, in the next verse says, fast a certain number of days, but if anyone of you is ill or on a journey, let him fast a similar number of days later on, in chapter 2. The relevance or connection of these verses is clear. Uh, no explanation needed. Or we have like in Allah Yamur Bil Adli Wal Ihsan wa Itad al Qurba wa Yanhan al Fahsha wal Munkar wal Bagi. Indeed Allah enjoins justice and good conduct and giving to relatives and forbids indecency and bad conduct and oppression. This verse stands on its own as Allah commands certain modes of behavior or a set of do's and don'ts. Then there are verses where the connection and relevance are not readily apparent, but can be seen through some reflection and deliberation. As such, people who are not adequately familiar with the Quranic methodology don't see the connection and think the Quran is made up of confusing medley of different verses. Sometimes the passage will be discussing a topic when another topic is interjected in the middle, so another connection must be made. Several scholars of the past have worked on this, like likes of uh, Borhan al-Din Bughai, who has a, you know, written a comprehensive multi-volume set on this very topic. Commentators like Imam Fakhr Razi also insists on making connections between verses in his commentary. And in some cases, he has made such subtle connections that required very deep thinking and study. Jalal al-Din Suyuti also has a book regarding this topic. One has to seek help from the works of past scholars and then build on it. Here, there are two points to consider. Number one, the Quran uses mezji or imtizaj, mixture method. What that means is that it brings up a topic and then mixes it with the historic or other witnesses. For example, when talking about Tawheed, oneness of God, it immediately brings up prophets who preached to their nation the oneness of God and worshiping Him alone. Then talks about their reaction, perhaps followed by a parable. 
Quran is not a boring book of laws and rules with a bunch of dry stipulation. It is fluid and mixture of things to drive the point. Stories or parables uh, that are given are always relevant to the present topic as well as the earlier topic. Unlike other books which usually have a very specific topic they focus on and discuss in detail and in various dimensions, then conclude. Number two, due to the fact the Qur'an was revealed gradually over 23 years, along with its revelation, a nation, Ummah, was being formed from days of few followers till the days they had migrated and actually formed a small state by building a ruling structure and society and later became a nation. Therefore, the Quran must be viewed as not just a book written by an author or two about a specific topic and specific audience in mind in a time capsule, rather a book that is training building and shaping a society as it is being written in real time over a span of 23 years. That is why its emphasis are in the fundamentals and principles of faith in its Meccan chapters, plus addressing the opposition, mainly idolaters, while its Madani chapters focusing more on the commands, laws, and social structure plus addressing people of the book, but using the same methodology and style as the uh, Meccan chapters. Among the skeptics who later came to admit was the French writer Roger Blacher, who said, each story listed in the Quran is a form of logic and reasoning as the Quran itself. Therefore, we must see the connection of verses in the Qur'an through this unique lens. It is a book that considers the external things, what was happening on the ground within the society, then issuing statements about it. Hence, we must often know the situation, historic and social contexts, in order to make these connections. For example, we read in chapter 85, Buruj, the big stars, by the sky containing great stars, and by the promised day, and by the witness and what is witnessed. Cursed were the companions of the trench, which is about the companions of Ukhdud trench, where they threw the believers into the fire pit as the believers resisted and did not give up on their belief in Tawheed. A reader who does not know the context surrounding this chapter might think, well, this is about a group of believers in the past who were tortured and killed due to their belief in one God. Read the verses and move on. Not even think about anything else. However, the Quran is making a great point here. In fact, has a reason for revealing these verses. When one studies this passage deeper, Within its historic context, one will find these verses were revealed at the time Prophet peace be upon him and his followers were under tremendous pressure, pressure to denounce their newfound faith. They were persecuted, tortured, and killed by the idolaters as these verses were revealed to acknowledge, to empathize with Muslims' pain and suffering. You know the story of Bilal and Ammar and his family and others. These verses not only apply to those days, 
they apply to Muslim situation and suffering today in many places around the world. Another example is Surat Yusuf, chapter 12. And while many bring it up when there is a talk of adultery because of how the minister's wife offered herself to Yusuf salam, as he declined, this chapter is a Meccan chapter. And there was nothing really specific going on in Mecca about adultery. It was more about Muslims being persecuted by Quraysh. So then, what's the relevance? Again, by studying the situation and events, we find chapter 12 was revealed mainly at a time Prophet, peace be upon him, was under pressure, especially by his own family and clan, so much that they attempted to kill him at his own home. The relevant verses give a message to the Prophet, which is not to despair. And Yusuf's brothers treated him similarly. But Allah took care of Yusuf. Hence, Allah will take care of the Prophet and Muslim situations as well. And also gives a signal to Quraysh, the enemy, that they are going against God and his messenger. Be forewarned. That is why when the Prophet ﷺ defeated Meccans without bloodshed and entered Mecca, he forgave them all. As he said, I will say to you as my brother Yusuf said to his brothers, Glory to Allah, may he forgive you. Another point about the Quran is that it contains supremacy over tone, which shows it is sent down from the high and the supreme being. And we did not create the heaven and the earth and all that is between them in vain. That is the opinion of those who disbelieve. The tone is that of one who has power over everything. One who created everything. Who is being addressed? It is toward the humble servant, the one who has submitted and surrendered to him, the noble messenger who receives the message and delivers it intact with full integrity to his followers and mankind in general. So there are two parties involved in the conversation at any point in the Quran. One is the transmitter, who is Allah Azawajal, and the other is the receiver, who is his messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. With exception of few verses where Prophet Muhammad alone is addressed, in almost all the other verses, the Prophet and all of his followers are addressed, directly or indirectly, then and now. The conversation could be about another people or nation, what God said to them, and what they said or did, all reported by God Almighty Himself. Or the conversation could be about a point, a command, a law, or an application of the law. Often there are verses that talk about a certain subject, but then all of a sudden the subject changes and the surah talks about something different and seemingly unrelated. Then jumps back to the main subject. For example, uh, just to clarify, an example in chapter 2, verses 221 through 241 talk about marriage and spousal relationship with the exception of verses 238 and 239. In the middle, talking about importance of prayer, even during a battle. It is as if Allah makes a virtual parenthesis to say, all these issues and commands related to family affairs 
are easily addressed by the believers who remember Allah and stay close to Allah by guarding their prayers. Verses 238 and 239 emphasize someone who prays to him, even in the most difficult times, such as in a war, such person would do the right thing not have any problems with being a good spouse, being a good advisor, and being a fair person. Next point is that once the connection or relevance between certain verses fade away, the verse in point becomes more independent, meaning the verse can be quoted by itself without having to bring up the verse or verses before and after, as we see it done routinely. Now, just like the fact many things in the nature are connected, but some connections are not apparent, like for example, we know earthquakes are caused by certain phenomenon inside Earth's crust, along certain fault lines. But we cannot pinpoint the time and the epicenter in ample time before it happens. Same way, sometimes the connection between some verses is hidden. But with some study and deliberation, one can find these connections, which are unlike connections in any other book. As an example, let's say the Quran wants to warn the Prophet's enemies. In chapter 36, which is a Meccan chapter, says, And had it been our will, we could have transformed them to remain in their places so that they could neither go forward nor return. So this is a threat. But the Qur'an wants the enemies to picture it in their mind and easily understand it. Because they did believe in God as the Creator. So it follows in the next verse, If we grant life, long life, to anyone, we cause him to be reversed in nature, will they not understand? Meaning, if we let one reach the old age, he reverses physically. You know, his hair gets gray, his vision declines, he will hunch over perhaps, he will slow down, become weak, etc. That is what the last verse called transformation, Masach, which is a natural transformation. In the next verse that we just recited, Allah says, I can remove the time factor in this natural reversal, hence they can turn old and in decline right now on the spot before getting to an old age, maybe through a stroke, etc. Only the Quran makes such connections between verses by drawing a picture in the reader's mind. It brings parables, not just to make the point, but to make it in a graphical way. So the reader gets it, gets the picture, as we say. Another example, in order to drive home the point about Resurrection Day, and this is done routinely in the Quran, the Quran taps into man's imagination and familiarity with nature by reminding him to look at the dry land, which comes to life with winds pushing the rain clouds over it, to bring it back to life. Or look at how we came to this world the first time through the elaborate process in the mother's womb and the, the, the delivery nine months and during the, uh, after nine months and how the Creator can bring us back to life the second time. All of which takes us to the point we can truly understand the concept as we identify it with the world we know. Such reminders are interjected anywhere there is talk of the Resurrection Day. 
To those who say Qur'an is man-made because its verses are disorderly or disconnected, we say there are many chapters within the Qur'an that contain contiguous verses and orderly around one topic, especially the short chapters like Al-Ikhlas, chapter 112, which is all about describing Allah Azza or Al-Asr. There are also long chapters that have contiguous verses, like chapter 12, Yusuf. If it was man-made, then the one who wrote these chapters could have made all chapters the same way. Why did he not? Hence, it appears the issue is due to their lack of understanding or anic methodology and style. Following points help us understand the coherence in the Qur'an. Number one, each surah has a theme around which its content revolves and makes it into a unified whole. Number two, together with the main text of a surah chapter, there is an introduction and a conclusion. Chapters have distinct uh, sections to mark thematic or contextual shifts and every section or passage is paragraphed to mark smaller shifts. Some chapters may be without sections. The verses of the introduction and the conclusion also may at times be divided into paragraphs. Number three, these paragraphs and sections relate to each other perhaps not through, not always through a verse-to-verse -verse linear connection, but through various literally terms like similarities, comments, conditional statements, parenthetical statements, principle statements, warning statements, or the conclusion of a theme, questions and their answers, and statements or passages which return to what is said in the beginning. Number four, the context of a chapter progresses through these paragraphs and sections and gradually build up, reach it, its culmination. As a result, each chapter assumes a distinct and unique form and shape as it becomes a complete chapter. As discussed in the past lectures, unlike any other book, the Qur'an learning never stops and it can be understood in different depths. There are three main levels of understanding of the Qur'an. The elementary level where the beginner takes a translation and starts reading it. And the more he reads it, the more understanding he gains, and at the same time, gaining knowledge on what the Qur'an is trying to say as a whole. In the next level, which is intermediate level, he learns the Arabic language in order to gain a deeper understanding of the meaning of the words, how they are used and why they are used in, in a certain context. The next level, which is the advanced level, is more for the scholars or jurists who need to have a deeper understanding of the verses, especially, you know, with laws, injunctions, commands, and etiquettes in order to drive fiqh or jurisprudence. Of course, there are many levels you can reach in between these three levels, depending on how deep you want to understand this book. The most common mistake critics of the Qur'an make in their interpretation is they overlook the context in which each verse was revealed. They completely ignore it. This is an essential to a deeper textual understanding, especially in verses that reference wars and conflicts, 
one can explain Quran with the Quran. Since the Quran is not ordered by topic like textbook chapters, it is necessary for one to be thoroughly familiar with other texts in the Quran which deal with the same topic or relate to it. Failure to do so may alter the overall message of the Quran concerning that particular topic. In fact, other texts in the Quran may be highly significant in determining the true meaning of a given text. When we consider all the events that occurred outside the Quran, but reflected and reacted in the Quran, then we begin to understand its goals and concerns. When we look at the Qur'an with what we just talked about, the understanding of its methodology, then the connections start appearing in precise order. And we begin to see how its mission is to deliver the universal message, not just to Arabic-speaking people, but the whole mankind. It is a warner of life's pitfalls and the consequences, as well as bearer of good news and rewards. We ask Allah to help us understand his book and cleanse our hearts and minds from any doubts and misunderstanding of the Qur'an and guide us to the right path. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi